Thank you so much, Professor, for this uh, great introduction. <laughs> uh, dear professors, colleagues, friends, a very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I'm grateful to, uh, to Center for South Asia for organizing this event. Grateful to uh, Professor Sumudu, Professor Saram, Dr. Andrea, Hannah, and all of you who joined me today like uh, for this session. I hope we are going to have a uh, fruitful uh, learning session today. So as Professor mentioned, I'm Siddharth, and I am currently a business scholar at Global Legal Studies Center, uh, Europe of Madison Law School, and also I'm a doctoral student at uh, South Asian University, New Delhi. So my uh, research basically is all about uh, the experiences of sustainable uh, Indian judiciary with sustainable development and today I will be uh, discussing a part of it with you all. So let us see uh, that what we have for today's session. First of all we will discuss the socio-economic needs of India. Moving further we will look for the environmental realities we have. Then we will see how those environmental realities have disproportionate uh, effects on different classes of people and finally and majorly we will be looking on the judicial decisions in India that how they are uh, dealing with this entire environment development social welfare issues so to start with very recently we uh, got this news that India has become the fifth largest economy in the world and this is not the like uh, stop like in the coming years india is projected to beat germany to become the fourth largest by 2026 even by 2027 28 it will become the third largest economy in the world morgan stanley estimates that india will double even more than double its current uh, gdp level by 2031 so this much massive growth path for india what does that mean means that uh, in the upcoming days uh, India is going to look after its uh, social economic priorities like poverty because uh, as per World Bank data uh, there's still like 10% uh, of the population which is uh, like belongs to the poverty uh, uh, standard moreover India has to look after its health sector uh, food security, infrastructure, clean energy, uh, access to justice for all, education, gender equality, and so on. So, like there are many uh, schemes for these all things, and this is something which India is planning in the upcoming years. Now, moving further, the environmental problems we have. After, uh, at the same time, we are uh, having certain environmental problems in India starting with air pollution which I think is common like in most of the parts of the world so as per the uh, 2021 World Air Quality Report it has been like, mentioned that 63 out of 100 uh, many polluted cities are in India to name a few Delhi, uh, Lucknow these are like the capital cities of Indian provinces and Indian India state as well, so uh, they are under this uh, category. PM 2.5 concentration is found to be uh, more than the required threshold, the prescribed threshold by WHO air quality guideline level. What are the causes? So causes are rising urbanization, booming industrialization, vehicular emissions, thermal power plants, all of these are contributing to this massive air pollution problem and this pollution problem is problematic because of its long-term health issues on people on uh, on environment so this is the one of the major problem second is water pollution so it is found that around 70 to 80 percent of untreated household water, waste water and 60 percent effluent discharges are directly released into water bodies. These water bodies are generally the source of drinking water and irrigation purposes and other things. 
every day like 40 million liters of wastewater enters the river and only tiny fraction of it gets appropriately treated. Illegal dumping of raw sea waste, silt, garbage into rivers, I mean these are the primary causes and it has been projected that uh, Indian government faces a loss of like uh, 6.7 and like 7.7 .7 billion dollars a year because of this uh, all the all the food which gets wasted, all the crop uh, which gets wasted because of water pollution in the surroundings. And as I mentioned with uh, air pollution, so goes with water pollution that it's this main source of livelihood and waterborne diseases like typhoid, cholera, hepatitis are affecting people, Indian citizens like enormously. Next in the list of these environmental problems is climate change. I'm sure you must have heard of, at least heard of this term, what is climate change? So as I go further, it refers to a long-term uh, change in the climatic weather patterns and particularly after 1800s, we have seen that human activities have started causing uh, or interfering with the uh, global heat, uh, I mean, global temperature of the of our planet so this is one of the ultimate reason for climate change and what does it has for India so warming climate and unusual unprecedented hot weathers we have every year in summers India is receiving immense heat waves and moving further since 1950s we have also seen a decline in rainfall Decline in rainfall along with um, increased number of droughts. So uh, idea is ultimately there is a fall in crop production and India is a country where which primarily depends upon uh, a rainfall fed water system for its agriculture needs. So when we see these figures it's very disturbing for the crop production. Moving further melting glaciers uh, because India has geographically located so we have uh, many rivers coming out of these glaciers in the northern Himalayan region and melting of glaciers means that uh, all those rivers fed by those glaciers they will be facing some change in their uh, or, uh, alteration in their courses or they will be um, soon dried up. So this is another problem and then we have coastal cities, I mean India has around more than 7,000 km long coastal lines, so Mumbai is one of the uh, like world's population, uh, largest population city, which has been exposed to coastal flooding, salt water intrusion, and along with Mumbai, Kolkata is on the eastern part of India, which, is, which also faces um, cyclones, storm surges like these, ultimately affecting the livelihood, life of people at large and these sea level rise storm surges like they are very frequent in coastal areas and lastly this climate change brings the issue of migration of uh, affected population from affected areas to internal uh, parts of india or even outside india or even uh, people from other countries other neighboring countries of india into indian continent indian country so uh, this ultimately uh, leads into the problem of climate refugees, which is another emerging issue. Next in line is solid waste. So like in India, 277 million tons of municipal solid waste are produced every year. And it is estimated that this will, re this will further increase to like 387 million tons and even by 2050, it will double the current value. Or the important fact is that only 20% of the total collected waste is processed and remaining 80% is dumped in landfill sites which is something problematic and uh, because of this like India currently produces 25,000 tons of plastic waste alone and this is something problematic for environment pollution and this waste is ultimately translated into uh, like uh, I mean uh, flows with Indus, Brahmaputra and Gan Ganges rivers they are carried with them and ultimately leaked into sea. So this problem is somewhat associated with water pollution and they go at the same time. Last in my list is biodiversity loss 
and uh, so India has like four majority uh, biodiversity hotspots, and these are like the Himalaya, Western Ghats, and Sunderland, and uh, Indo Burma region. But all the like it has been suggested by this report by Center for Science and Environment that India has already lost 90 percent of the area under these four hotspots, and. Um, even IUCN has is like currently monitoring 1,212 animal species which are classified as endangered. And um, talking about the causes of these biodiversity loss, these are somewhat destruction of the habitat, uh, extension of agriculture, need for agricultural land, filling up of wetlands. I mean, these are the same reasons somewhat which are, are like industrialization and human habitats. So ultimately reasons are somewhat common and this is the current scenario in regards to uh, uh, environmental problems with India. And I have mentioned only five as of now considering we are going to have a longer debate but these problems they are more in number. And this is a multiplier considering that India has become the world's like largest population like in, in this January itself so 1.4 billion people we have and this is the biggest multiplier because everything which we just talked about just because I mean it gets multiplied we need more houses more food um, like demand gets higher because of the population so everything environmental uh, natural resources are like more uh, stressed considering this factor. Now, these environmental problems which I just discussed, they are not the same for everyone. So, as uh, uh, Kesu Rao uh, mentioned that uh, air is equally distributed to all, whether it rich or poor. But it's the impacts of air pollution are disproportionately uh, felt by poorer people. So, there is a reason that those uh, people having higher income, they contribute more to environment pollution because they consume more energy, uh, they consume more products and at the same time they have the capability to uh, mitigate those uh, environmental concerns which everybody is suffering. So imagine they have a good uh, health uh, uh, um, a system with them, they live in like a, a good, uh, um, in, I mean, apartments, facilities. They have air conditioning. I mean, those. Uh, I mean, the good technology is on their side. It, is, it looks like that. On the, on the other hand, those people with a lower income, they don't contribute to this problem first of all, and at the same time, they don't have adequate resources to tackle these environmental problems. So this is one of the important problems with uh, the environmental concerns that it is the persons living in poverty, they suffer the most. Next in line is the migrants and their families. So uh, as we discussed that, um, that uh, climate is having effects on India and uh, on agriculture particularly. So people residing in, in villages, they don't have, I mean, they, do, they are not able to meet up the, the required crop production, they are not able to sustain their families and ultimately people are moving from local or I mean, uh, the village to cities. This kind of uh, uh, migration is happening at the same time but these migrants are not well placed in city first of all because they are not coming from a, a, a wealthy background so they ultimately reside in some slums in the city or in or on any government lands, they uh, they make jugis. Jugis are like uh, the uh, the huts, small huts for uh, with very minimal resources. So these people are technically invisible for the government or uh, those policies which government launches. So, for example, I mean, any any uh, in case of any uh, extremity, these are the ones who suffer the most. So, for example, recently we had COVID-19 situation. Migrants were seen to be most affected when it was uh, conveniently said that uh, lockdown has been imposed and everybody should stay within their home. 
but for migrants staying at their homes was not a good option because they don't have a proper home they don't have proper resources so that they can stay at their home and can sustain for like 2 3 months or even more than that so next in the line is our tribals and indigenous communities whenever any developmental industrial activity happens in on any native on any uh, 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 forest land or any place where these communities are already in place those who are supposed to uh, uh, like relocated or rehabilitated or displaced and the problem is they don't even get compensation sometimes don't even get compensation because in tribes there is a culture of like um, they tribes don't inherit the land in terms of our legal system works like uh, they don't believe in property rights property laws that kind of so they stays at a place and since they don't have any uh, position in in legal sense they don't they don't qualify as a people they who should be compensated for their displacement so this is something they suffer next in line are the women and children women uh, due to their it, it has been uh, said in uh, united nation conference on climate change uh, that women suffer the most out of climate change because of physical uh, biological cultural political reasons so uh, if i add the, the illiteracy poverty uh, uh, nutrition nutritional deficiencies in times of pregnancy and menstruation women uh, are exposed more to these circumstances and they suffer more women in india they are the person who stays more inside home where like in common household uh, people still uh, depends upon uh, stoves for cooking purposes so it is uh, seen that pollution is more due to these cooking uh, things inside home men on the other hand is like is supposed to stay outside of the home so technically women are more exposed to it another situation where women are more exposed is that in some uh, communities women are the, uh, are supposed to uh, assemble water for their family and household purposes and as water resources are drying up they have to travel more and more distances which is again uh, problematic for their health because they have to carry the uh, the, the water i mean this is uh, uh, problematic for their neck for their spine and uh, even those contaminated waters if they are come across something like that they are the ones who get uh, affected by those uh, polluted water sources so this is something uh, which is problematic for women and same goes with children because of their age they are so small i mean they cannot uh, cope up with the uh, challenges of the weather in line we have senior citizens and the same goes with them the, they are not aware of those uh, information regarding uh, evacuation or these people they are in, in, imagine they live in some in this traditional setup where they speak a language which is very i mean which, which is a minority language or, or they don't know any um, other languages so in case of emergencies they are only dependent upon their um, the, fam the the primary household member for any evacuation or uh, gathering resources after uh, uh, the disaster took place so i mean these situation make senior citizen vulnerable and and so like so are the persons with disabilities these this list is uh, not exhaustive there are many people who suffers through the uh, uh, disproportionality uh, disproportionately uh, through the environmental concerns but we should focus more on the other i mean uh, on the next part of our uh, presentation which uh, is about indian judiciary and how what role indian judiciary is playing in terms of environment so indian judiciary uh, when we talk of this particular topic i would like to start with the uh, our discussion with this incident 1984 bhopal gas tragedy because since around that around 1980s indian judiciary has started taking up uh, cases which are related to environment i mean it was 
even globally, this was the era when uh, countries were gaining, uh, like developing countries especially were gaining more uh, 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 attraction towards this emerging uh, need for uh, 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 pollution-free environment and uh, a, a healthy, safe environment. So, Bhopal gas tragedy, actually, um, there was a pesticide plant in India, in Bhopal, uh, and there's a gas uh, methyl isocyanate which accidentally released one night and ultimately it caused around 15 to 20,000 deaths and injured thousands more in this scenario. This was such a brutal incident and uh, uh, even, even everybody was very shocked uh, out of this incident and government at that time drafted this legislation, Environmental Protection Act which ultimately become uh, for India become the uh, umbrella legislation which takes care of I mean regulates all the activities of center and state pollution control board and managing all the other uh, environmental acts. So this was the uh, immediate uh, contribution by legislature and this contribution I mean this legislation this uh, effect of Bhopal gas tragedy is not limited to India but even in US, uh, US came up with this Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act so as to uh, maintain all the toxic and hazardous substances within the, uh, uh, their territory. So this, these were like the uh, uh, immediate uh, legislative uh, recourses and but let us move further with the judicial part because when legislature was doing this much Judiciary in India was also uh, evolving and uh, so I mean see how Indian judiciary has referred to uh, gas leak disaster or Bhopal I mean this this consciousness or this sensitization happened with Indian, Indian judiciary that it started taking environmental matters very seriously and uh, in the upcoming at the same time Indian judiciary was also going through a reforms. So let me talk about like two primary reforms which India, Indian judiciary did at that time. First was regarding the uh, elimination of locus standi rule. So I, uh, this is something technical. I mean legal technical. So let me explain in like simple words. If any person has any dispute in the court only that person whose rights have been violated or infringed can go to the court. This is the traditional rule of locus standi or standing that if you have suffered personal injury or your legally protected interests are violated, only you can go to the court so to seek compensation remedy or anything else. But court in India, they made a shift from this traditional rule and they introduced the system of public interest litigation. So now a person who who is like who is not directly affected by the injury can also go to the court. This provision was important for people belonging to uh, lower social classes because they are not aware of their rights. They are not aware when their rights got violated. And, and it, is, it has been seen that these people, they are not able to, they don't have adequate resources to come up to the courts. So, I mean, the interest of these people, like, ultimately was not satisfied. And because of public interest litigation, now anyone who, as judiciary says, publicly spirited people can come up with the cause of local population, people belonging to uh, poor backgrounds, and take up the case. So, uh, Justice P. N. Bhagwati is one of the leading judges of India. So he, I mean, made this observation in one of the cases, S. P. Gupta versus Union of India, and this decision is of 1981. So that yeah, that such a person or determined class of person, any reason like poverty, helplessness, disability, socially or economically uh, disadvantaged position all of their interests can now be represented in the court. So this was one of the uh, uh, major reforms India had that time. Another reform uh, was that India uh, 
do not have any provision regarding environment uh, in its constitution. In 1976, Indian constitution saw an amendment uh, which uh, which uh, made that the state should look after, protect its environment. Uh, it's the fundamental duty of every citizen of India to look after their environment. But even then, Indian citizen didn't have any right to environment in very clear sense. So this is this article 21 in the Constitution of India, which says that everybody has the right to life and personal liberty. I mean, this is the provision is in, in, in loose sense says that everybody has a right to life and property. What judiciary contributed in this case, in, in this uh, article is that it expanded the meaning of the word right to life. So right to life now means not just mere living. Right to life should also mean a dignified way of living, a quality of lifestyle one should have. How to ensure a quality lifestyle? It means that anything which is uh, restricting your uh, good way of life is in violation of this provision. So a bad environment is in violation of right to life. And that's how court uh, derived that right to live is a fundamental right under Article 21. And it includes right to enjoyment of pollution free water and air. And with I mean, this case was just the starting in 1991. After that, court just keep on modifying the language. And today we have a very well Though constitution does not provide a specific right, but through these judicial decisions, India has a proper right to pollution-free, safe, and healthy, and sustainable environment. So this is an interesting quote that, uh, as we have seen that how Indian judiciary uh, break some uh, stereotypes uh, before. So uh, uh, Shyam has commented that uh, in India, uh, the role of uh, Supreme Court is everything. I mean, policy maker, law maker, public educator, and everything. Because if you compare it with US, so US, I mean, it's just that they have, uh, I mean, everybody has a specific task to do. But uh, in India, Supreme Court is doing everything. So this is a more uh, active, I mean, how judiciary started uh, behaving in active manner, this is what it says. And now come to sustainable development. So sustainable development is a principle which formally started like developing in 1972. Uh, we have all the countries came together in Stockholm and they had a conference in 1972 talking about human and developmental issues. And since then, they started uh, uh, negotiating or discussing this idea of sustainable development. But only until like 1987, uh, there was a commission formed, uh, which is also popularly known as Brentland Commission. And in 1987, they came out with a definition for sustainable development, which means that development meets the need of present without compromising the ability of future generation to meet their own needs. It can be break down into four categories that it, this, this definition says that uh, interest of present uh, and future generation should be reserved. Interest, uh, sorry, yeah interest of present that is uh, the intra-generational equity should be preserved, intergenerational equity should be preserved, interest of uh, environment should be pr uh, protected as well as social development and uh, social economic and environmental aspects should be merged. So I mean just in a simple way if I try to explain it, this is like you should take care of environment, economic development and social welfare in an integrated manner when you make any decision. So this is the idea of sustainable development and how court started uh, adopting uh, this principle. So it was in this Bellow Citizen case in 1996 for the first time when, uh, I mean, so as before, before uh, stating what I was saying, so as of now what we have seen, let's uh, revise everything. Um, 
there are environmental problems there are uh, uh, we have seen instances of economic development economic prosperity and we have also seen instances of social challenges so how to balance all of the three because in itself all of them are important at this and and we have to take care of this thing so in this case court was uh, court was looking an issue that in this case uh, some untreated effluents were discharged in river pala which is a local river and some main source of water supply and it has all these effluents has contaminated the uh, local water body and residents they have no safe drinking water so and these uh, untreated effluents were released by those tanneries which involved in leather producing business in india leather producing and exporting is considered to be i mean what it was found to be in this case one of the big industry which generates lots of export revenue so this was a difficult case for judiciary because on one hand we have tanneries who produce economic who generates revenue for india we have people who rely on those water for drinking and at the same time we have environment i mean water pollution is in itself something serious so this case so that i mean court said that see everything has to be done in a way that somehow it should be balanced and court ultimately uh, found that these development ecologies eco ecology which appears to be opposed to each other is actually not opposed to each other sustainable development is the answer and they should be taken in integrated manner and uh, how it should be done court uh, in this case court said that so see there is a carrying capacity of ecosystem you can develop you can uh, pollute the environment but to an extent to which environment can uh, is capable of restoring itself if your development exceeds that limit where developmental consequences have become irreversible that is not allowed so you sh you you should develop you should uh, uh, do all the uh, uh, discharges and everything but you should keep in mind the carrying capacity of the environment this was this kind of harmony was established in this velour case this is one of the significant cases in india because after this many cases i mean relied on this these uh, guidelines and these uh, reasonings so uh, i mean just to quote an example like if like we have some some like some movies which we have which we see like they, they, these are the movies of a decade so this was like the decision of a decade where which is considered to be the uh, the the significant uh, center point another case uh, this <coughs> is about narmada narmada bachao andolan versus union of india narmada is a river in india and this case is related to construction of a dam and all the technical things like relating to the height of the dam uh, the environmental impact assessment and rehabilitation resettlement of for project affected person these things were issue in this case because again the same argument construction of a dam is important for uh, uh, energy generation electricity generation but at the same time construction of a dam is causing displacement of uh, of people tribals and there is not proper rehabilitation mechanism established for this purpose what should be done court said go ahead court uh, relied on this sustainable development principle and in this case court said we should have uh, a dam that's not a problem but yeah look for rehabilitation but what was found in this case that uh, the displacement was not implemented properly so professor uh, deepa badran uh, highlights environmental justice issue in this case that uh, tribals who are like the uh, people like i mean i mean these people they are removed or dislocated from their lands for the interest of the downstream people their their uh, energy needs and other uh, uh, people who are living in cities for their interest these people they are uh, 
expelled from their traditional lands. Um, no, dis no regard to their uh, cultural rights, social rights, and nothing like that. So, this, I mean, these are like the lines from the judgment that for larger good, they are being displaced. Another uh, public servant, L.C. Janji, he mentions that, uh, I mean, he highlights that court have used certain reasonings that we are doing favor to these tribal people, to uh, moving them from tribal lands to cities, because in this way, they are going to become a part of the mainstream society. So this should be seen that they should enjoy the fruits of science and technology which they are not enjoying right now by staying in forests or any other uh, parts of the land. So this kind of arguments were made and uh, even uh, he hi highlighted that uh, in previous cases when it comes for rehabilitation packages, the ground reality is somewhat different because uh, they are not provided adequate packages, I mean adequate rehabilitation and in this case particularly was talking about the displacement of 2 lakh people, around 2 lakh people. Like, so this much of population rehabilitation was a big challenge and this is what highlighted. Again, uh, Professor Philip Collett notes in this case that uh, they have not uh, identified the uh, requirement of public participation in this case. So again, this was some challenges with that people should be uh, involved in the decision making process before, uh, I mean those who are affected, they should be involved in the process. One more thing which I talk about this case is that we have just discussed how judiciary was uh, acting in more active fashion uh, regarding public interest litigation. In this case, judiciary, uh, I mean in this case, the judges have kind of restricted the uh, ambit of public interest PI, uh, public interest litigation that, uh, uh, that that PI should not be brought up in every case and uh, I mean and especially when it comes to governmental decisions so you should not bring uh, PILs because if government has is doing something it must have thought of things so it's just wastage of time and so you, I mean this thing should be considered before filing PIL so this is kind of a, uh, a limiting a scope of this thing which was done earlier. So similar to Narmada Dam, there was another dam, Tehri Dam in Uttarakhand region of India and uh, same facts like same issues regarding rehabilitation and all. In, and in this Tehri Dam case again court allowed construction of dam, relocation of people but what I wanted to highlight is that there was a dissenting judge. So dissenting judge is a, is a judge <coughs> who, uh, I mean, the ultimate decision of the court says that dam should be constructed, but dissenting judge is like, has some say in that, that this is a separate, I mean, a, 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 I, a, I'm not agreeing with the uh, main decision. So he made certain reservations to that main decision. And uh, he found that, uh, that there are uh, circumstances when uh, conflict arises, I mean, between the interest of people and in those situations, less advantaged group is expected to be given a prior attention by welfare state. So anyway, but this is more like, this is not a part of the, op I mean, this is not an operative part of the judgment. So it is just, it, it's just insane. It has no uh, actual uh, implication, at least for this case. This is another interesting case. So we talked about how Delhi uh, is facing pollution, and uh, to curb that pollution, uh, that uh, to deal with air pollution, judiciary gave a, an order in 1998 that all commercial public transport should change from diesel or petrol to compressed natural gas. So all public transport, so public transport. By this uh, court meant public buses, taxis, and auto rickshaws. They should change that uh, from diesel to CNG. By the way, if you don't know what is auto rickshaws, let me uh, share the photograph of auto rickshaw. So this is how I mean they were supposed to change their uh, engines, uh, which should run on CNG. Yeah. So. Uh, 
ultimately the after effects of this case was that uh, oh, so see one more one more thing in this case uh, only why only uh, public transport vehicles were asked to uh, make this shift because private vehicles were remained unaffected in this order and also at this time in 1988 it like they gave the period of 3 years around that by 1st of april i think 1st of april 2001 all this transformation should have been done but uh, at that time it was doubtful whether cng is a good alternative or not cng as a fuel is a good alternative or not i mean these are some concerns but ultimately this decision has an effect on local people because it is these people who are using public transport buses and because of this transformation there was like a huge uh, shortage of buses shortage of public transport and those people like local people who for them uh, transportation is like a basic necessity and in some ways transportation holds priority over environmental standards their life ultimately got affected and uh, as i said the private vehicles were remain remain unaffected so people of like uh, of higher economic class they remain unaffected out of this decision another aspect of this decision was that those who were the auto rickshaws i mean i just mentioned the three wheel scooter rickshaws uh, drivers they were uh, again on the receptive end of this decision because as i mentioned to convert uh, petrol or diesel engine to cng engine required huge investments which they didn't had and uh, because of which they had to get out of the business if they don't do that transformation also they had to take loans now banks won't give them loan loans have to be taken by pipe or public uh, other uh, i mean financiers or something like that arrangement has to be done that is another kind of a trap i can say uh, i mean say uh, so with this and even yeah at that time uh, even the cng supply was not in adequate quantity so delhi in the i mean it was seen that for in for like two three years there were long lines of these auto rickshaws at the filling station so ultimately things were not very good for uh, these auto rickshaw drivers and at the same time there was another decision came which said that uh, that the number of uh, uh, i mean that no new permit will be given for auto rickshaw drivers so uh, in that case uh, i mean and this decision uh, ultimately discouraged people to get into this business and even those who were in this business they turned out from a, a, an owner of a auto rickshaw to a, a daily lay, a daily wage labor for some other uh, contractor or something like that so this entire business got shifted and this is one of the consequences of uh, this case court order which primarily emphasizes on environment but somehow we see this social impact as of now i was talking about sustainable development in terms of uh, carrying capacity and in, in the in gradual cases uh, gradually uh, the court started making a shift that see if you are uh, applying sustainable development now you what you have to see that you have to apply the principle of proportionality you have to introduce you have to balance the interest of uh, people that uh, i mean those larger section of people who are getting more benefit that uh, i mean should be preferred and that should get primacy over uh, the case so in case if you if any economic activity has to happen you have to see who is getting the benefit and that has to be decided so this case set up another i mean this is more like our velour this also this uh, is more like a landmark case and uh, the immediate impact of this case was seen in another blue lady case where a ship has to be dismantled in the coast of uh, alang gujarat and uh, everybody was saying that it, this ship has radioactive material as bestows should not do but court found that it will generate revenue employment 
it will uh, bring uh, steel. So I mean, all these arguments were given, and it found that this has more weightage. So cons again, see, considering the concept of sustainable development, we should allow this ship dismantling. And so this was how uh, Court preferred economic interest in the previous case. In 2013, Vedanta case, this case is about my bauxite mining in Nyangri Hill Range. Ministry of Environment said that if you allow, if you permit uh, this mining in Odisha, it will have impact on the uh, local people, environment, and uh, things. So uh, you should not do it. But court, uh, I mean, but, but in this case, I mean, this is celebrated because in this case, court did took acknowledgement of the uh, rights of uh, people, uh, I mean, the, the, the traditional uh, uh, forest dwellers and the local native uh, people, their cultural, uh, customary, religious rights were considered in this case and court ultimately also recognized the importance of Gram Sabha saying that if people of that region, they decide that they want to have this kind of mining in their premises, in their, in their hill, go for it. If they don't decide, you are not allowed. So ultimately, all 12 Gram Sabha, Gram Sabha is actually a general assembly of local people. So Gram Sabha, they denied, I mean, this is another one of, of its kind uh, cases in India because it talked of environmental referendum. And all of these Gram Sabha denied that no, we don't want uh, this mining activity to happen in our premises. So that's it. So from all of this, what we have seen is that I'm just concluding now uh, that environment, uh, that, that sustainable development is a good promising concept, but it needs to be empowered, empowered in a way to include, to address social issues which are happening at the same time, because. Uh, and, and we should take into consideration the elements of justice, fairness and equity when we invoke sustainable development. Also what we found is that there is some inconsistency in judicial approaches. Sometimes court is uh, favoring environment uh, immensely, sometimes uh, uh, developmental concerns. So there is no consistency. In recent cases there has been seen that, we have seen that uh, judges talk about the uh, role of I mean, uh, environmental rule of law, so that a stability can be brought in the in these development environment cases. I would like to finish with these words of uh, uh, Julian Eggman, Willard, and Evans that sustainability cannot be simply green, uh, or uh, I mean, it should include a true sustainable society is one where wider questions of social needs welfare, economic opportunity are integrally related to environmental limits. And this is somewhat hints toward a concept of uh, known as just sustainability, which is more wider in terms of sustainable development. So that's it. Uh, thank you.